Good afternoon and welcome to another River Landing Conversation. My name is Jim Kalaki and along with my good friend Kay Heflin, we are here to um, have you all meet one of our distinguished residents, Rod Winther. <laughs> yes, Rod, it's you. <laughs> okay, all right, I'm just checking. And um, it is a delight to welcome you to this series and we're looking forward to this conversation to see. Should be fun. Indeed, yes. I've been anticipating this for ever since we <laughs> asked needles. you and you said yes. yes. <laughs> Kay, yeah. welcome. Let's go. Let's start off at the beginning, oh. your childhood. I know you're not an East Coast guy. No. So why no. don't you tell us what it was like growing up out West? Well, um, First of all, you always have to tell people where Idaho is. Okay. Um, for those of you watching, I'm from, I was born in Nampa, Idaho. Uh, I went to elementary and elementary school there. We moved to Payette, Idaho, home of Harmon Killebrew, if you are a Minnesota ah, Twins, Twins fan. All right. Uh, went to junior high there, and then I went to high school in Corvallis, Oregon. So all in the, all in the Pacific Northwest. But it was nice because my moving coincided with the change in educational schools. So when I went to junior high, people really didn't know that I was new until I said something. And when I went to high school, they didn't know the same thing. So that worked out really well. Uh, my dad was a music teacher, public school music teacher, so we, we moved accordingly. Um, but it was great, I and mean, when you grew up in the Northwest, there was so much to do. Most of it related to outdoors. And, you know, I wanted to be, I wanted to be Lewis and Clark. You know, I thought Sacagawea. And, you Did know, you make any discoveries? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Other than I, you know, I miss the mountains. Yeah. I miss the mountains awful. Rod, you mentioned being in high school in Oregon. I hadn't ever thought about this before, but is there, is there a kind of a competition between Idaho and Oregon in terms of, <laughs> oh, those foreigners uh, to the west of us or to the east of us or no. whatever? No. Uh, you know, if you're in Oregon, live in Oregon, anyone who lives in Idaho is almost immediately a second-class citizen uh -huh. in their minds. Yes. So uh, <laughs> I'm afraid of, it's more looking down, if anything. Yeah. Um, but there's a real sense of independence from people from, from the West. Mm -hmm. and they're very proud of it. And it doesn't matter if you're Idaho, Oregon, Washington, uh, Montana. I mean, my goodness, look at, look at Wyoming with the latest you know, election results and so forth. I mean, they wear that independence on their sleeve. So I, I think I fit in pretty well. Good. What, what kind of activities filled your days when you were growing up? Mm. Well, my mom had MS, and from just about the earliest I can remember, so taking care of her, my brother was six years younger, so that kind of fell onto me. So that, that was kind of one of the first things you do. Okay. You know, she, she wasn't able to cook, uh, house cleaning, you know, those sorts mm -hmm. of things. Um, I became very good at iron which I still maintain to this day. <laughs> um, so while that was a, you know, a rough thing, it was actually a really good thing because it taught me to be independent. Uh, unlike a lot of my, you know, my friends who could come and go as they wished, I, I didn't have that, mm -hmm. that luxury. But it's, it, was a good, it was a good opportunity for me to, uh, to learn about the other side of life, other than just playing. But being a musician, uh, the son of musicians, um, of course I was always in band and orchestra and I had to practice. Um, and your I, instrument was? Uh, well, I started on oboe. And uh, dad needed an oboe player in his band. And then all of a sudden he found an oboe player and then he needed a bassoon player in his band. So every time he needed something, it seemed like that's what I would change to. So I, um, I transferred over to bassoon when we 
able to pay it. And then that stayed with that throughout my life. If you could have picked your own instrument, is there something different you would have chosen? Mm, maybe cello. I've always thought, whenever I hear Ken Massey play, mm -hmm. I, I say, oh, I, I really would like that. Harp is a beautiful instrument. Uh, my granddaughter plays the viola, and I think that's a great mm -hmm. instrument. I would probably tend toward an instrument that wasn't played a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. Flute and clarinet, it seems like there's always a, a ton of them. Mm -hmm. So after high school, um, <clears throat> what did you do? Well, uh, in high school, I w became a long distance runner. And so I would run a mile, two mile, mm -hmm. five mile, and so forth. Uh, and I got a scholarship to uh, be a runner at the University of Idaho which is where I wanted to go to school anyway, because um, they had a really good music program. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to school at University of Idaho, which is in Moscow, not Moscow, Moscow. Um, and I ran for two years. I did well. I was all district. You know, I would have lettered for four years. But being a musician takes a lot of time mm -hmm. and practice and you just don't have that luxury. So after two years, I decided to focus just on my music. And as it was, it still took me five years, and I still hadn't graduated. So I know, it's pitiful. <laughs> and then the draft came, and I, I got a really, really low number. So I was, my draft board was in Corvallis, Oregon, and I was gone, 1970, uh, drafted in the U.S. Army, and I spent three years in the Army. Great. What was your job? What did you do in the Army? I actually, I played in the band. Spent two years in Indianapolis, uh, and then was transferred to Anchorage, Alaska. Played in the band up there. Completely different experiences. Yeah. Uh, one was the Indianapolis band was the Army Finance Center, so everything was all khakis and there wasn't any much military to mm -hmm. it. It was like college campus. Yeah. Anchorage was a whole different story. They took that stuff really serious up there. So, you know, you had to go out on patrol and just because you played in the band didn't give you any didn't special favors. <laughs> so, but it was, it was good. I did a lot of conducting um, and uh, was a librarian for both, both bands. So it was, it turned out okay. Three years, you know, not the end of the world. And after the military? Well, I came home to Moscow, um, got married, uh, and taught uh, public school music. Mm. Oh, I got my master's in there. Uh, I taught junior high and high school band and strings. Mm -hmm. My first job teaching was strings. Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it was one of those things where I would go and that night, and I had a violin, and I would practice, practice, practice. And I'd go the next day, and I would teach what I learned. And then, then that night, I would go and practice, practice, practice. And, and I literally stayed ahead of my students. This was elementary school, like one day at a time. And uh, gradually, I got better. You know, I didn't have to do that quite so much. But it was great. Um, I realized that teaching at public school wasn't my, probably wasn't the best level for me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think I'm a pretty patient person, but boy, <laughs> I tell you that, junior high especially, yes. that's, that's a whole different ball game. So I got a chance to go to Purdue University to teach. And I was pretty young still. And so I went to Purdue for a year, learned a lot. Then I went to Oregon State University in Corvallis. So I was going back to where I went to high school. And I was there for two years. And then I went to Eastman for work on my DMA for two years. And then my first real gut gig was at uh, Ithaca College. Mm. Uh, Ithaca, New York, and I was there for 15 years. 
I imagine everyone probably knows this, but in case not, um, the Eastman School of Music is <laughs> renowned in the world of music. Yeah, that was big Rochester. time. And, that was big time. Uh, the fact that you were there, um, well, Eastman, let me put it this way, and I mean this in the nicest way, <laughs> um, absolutely deserve to have you. Oh. And, uh, but it's, a, it's, it's one of the country's premier um, You know, walking out on the Eastman Theater stage the first time, and here are these, all these students that would be future students at New York Philharmonic in Boston and so forth. Um, I mean, you really had to up your game to make sure that you were capable of working with mm -hmm. them. But walking out on that first stage, realizing, oh, this is like Carnegie Hall. It was like almost every great musician you can think of had performed on that stage. So here I am from <laughs> Idaho. And what's wrong with this picture? But it was great. It was wonderful to you. Yeah. What was your position at Ithaca? I was director of bands. So I was responsible for conducting the wind ensemble. I also did talk conducting. Uh, did chamber music and um, other things within the music ed program. But primarily as director of bands, I was responsible for three different groups. That was fun. That was a great school. That was a really, really good school. I, I was lucky to, I went when I was 35. So I was pretty young for that mm -hmm. job. And uh, then after Ithaca, I, I was 50, and I went to Cincinnati Conservatory. And I stayed there until I retired. So I was, I really have had two big jobs. Mm -hmm. At Ithaca, um, I'm always, given my own life in higher ed, oh, sure. I'm always curious about relationships between schools. So in the world of music at Ithaca, did you all have much to do with Cornell? Or, or were, there, were you we, kind of we separate? We cross-pollinated yeah. a little bit. <clears throat> Cornell was much more of a research institution. Yeah. Uh, Ithaca was more music education and performance. Uh, so some of our faculty would teach at Cornell mm -hmm. as adjuncts. Um, there was an orchestra in town that we all played in. Uh, and one of my dearest friends and composer, uh, Karel Husa, uh, whose music guy, he's on my list. Uh, he, he taught at Cornell. So, and then taught at Ithaca also. Mm -hmm. So we were lucky in that respect. But there was really quite a bit of difference. The, the students that were in performance groups at Cornell were the engineers, the, you know. So they music was music a sideline. Well, yeah. Uh, unless you were in history mm -hmm. or theory or something like that, then it was, mm -hmm. then it was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. So talk a bit about Cincinnati then, and what life as a faculty member was like there. And well, okay, so it was interesting. I, I kind of got my chops wetted at Eastman. Mm -hmm. And those two years showed that I could work successfully with faculty and students uh, in performance. Then I went to Ithaca, and that was just a little bit less, but a great school, 500 music majors. Um, Cincinnati is, was the second largest uh, conservatory in the United States, wow. only behind University of North Texas. Um, but the faculty were world-renowned, um, and the students came from everywhere, and they were really, really good, on a par with any students mm -hmm. in the country. Um, and so that was really, really great. And I had a lot of freedom. I conducted the, uh, the wind ensemble there. I had two wonderful chamber music programs, uh, which put me into a whole different world of literature. I wrote a book uh, and traveled the world. It was. Pretty cool. 
talk a little bit about that traveling the world. I know there's one country that has a special place in your heart mm. that you spent lots of time. A lot of time, Taiwan. And they're in the news a lot right now. Mm -hmm. I see that their uh, trade delegation is starting to open up talks, which is great. But yes, Taiwan, I started to go to Taiwan. One of my doctoral students had a girlfriend who was a flute player from Taiwan. <laughs> and she, someone, a group in Taiwan was looking for a guest conductor. And she said, oh, get Professor Winter. He's great. So they asked me to come. And I kept going off and on for 20 years. And then uh, I was lucky enough to get a Fulbright and it allowed my wife and I to go live there for six months. Right. And that just, I would go back there in a flash. I mean, it's just a wonderful country. It's, it's cosmopolitan. The people are smart, uh, warm, welcoming. The food is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and they make great music. They really care about their, their music making. Uh, at all levels, whether it's, you know, the little kids whose feet don't even touch mm -hmm. the floor up to professionals. And uh, they have great music facilities. Their main performance hall in Taipei is stunning. And, uh, but they have great halls all around the country. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it does have a special place. Yep. Rod, what's it, if you can remember, what was it like I mean, you talk about going on the stage at, uh, um, at Eastman, but when you're in Taiwan and you're doing a major conducting con or, um, concert. concert, and you walk out the first time, and here are, what, 100 or 120 people waiting for you to uh, get there. I've, I've often wondered what, what sort of goes through <laughs> one's head as a conductor at that particular moment. Well, it's hopefully you're prepared for the moment mm -hmm. and you work hard at it. Uh, you want to be positive, make sure your people in the group are, are in a right frame of mind to be successful. I think the biggest thing that a conductor has to do is to enable the people they work with, give them the tools to succeed. And that's true, I'm as true here at, at River Landing. Um, that's my biggest job. Uh, now how you do that, you know, is always uh, a question, but um, you know, you try to do it with warmth and humanity. Um, but the wonderful thing about live performance is you just never know yes. what's gonna happen. You know, every now, you think, Oh yeah, this is the easy one, the easy piece, and all of a sudden you go, ah, it's a train wreck. Or uh, and that happens, and that's that's just something that's part of the adrenaline. I mean, it's it's not to be feared, uh, but to be used. Yeah. Okay. And one other question along those lines: when <clears throat> when you um, announce a concert, and this is the program. Mm -hmm. Is that, is it typically the conductor who says who this is the, the program? Picks the repertoire. And then, because I've thought, I've, I've go to the Eastern Music Festival oh, here, yeah. and every week the concert is just, the, on Saturday nights, it's magnificent. And I sit there and think, you know, who actually gets the music to all of the players with all of the instruments, and I mean, there must be a huge amount of well, there's support um, staff and so forth, legwork yeah. that yeah. that we never think much about. But I'm always, um, yeah. The, so there's kind of different levels to that question. Uh, if you're a professional orchestra, then the conductors they have a lot of guest conductors that come yeah. in and out. So what they would do is say, okay, here's here's a list. Here are five concertos I'd like to do. Here are five symphonies I'd like to do. Here are five overtures I'd like to do. Here's some works by contemporary composers that I'm really good at right now. And then the, the committee within the orchestra then would go through and say, okay, 
we haven't done Beethoven second in a long time, so let's do that. And they kind of cherry pick depending on what has been done mm -hmm. most recently and what the aims of that year might be. Let's say there's an emphasis on women composers. Well, then you're going to. So, is this committee that. elected by members of the orchestra, the, appointed by the conductor? Uh, no, well, probably more by the board. And it okay. would include members of the orchestra. Okay. Absolutely. Um, and again, they're, they're, that's more for guest conductors. Sure. Okay. Now, for the resident conductor, you have. They have to plan the season. So they're looking at, let's say, the uh, Greensboro Symphony has 10 concerts. So usually there's some sort of overall arching theme, you know, uh, and certainly within the concert there would be. And then you just pick repertoire that's going to work with that. Again, based on the needs of the orchestra, the needs of the audience. Uh, you know, budget. Mm -hmm. You can't do Verdi Requiem every, you know, or Beethoven 9 every concert, because they're expensive, requires a lot of people. Now, in my case, um, you know, I, I operated mostly in the academic world. Um, but even within professional groups, I would, I would say, this is what I want to do. And then, like in Taiwan, I worked with the same group over and over again. So I could kind of fit what I would like to do into their program and also for me overall. So it worked out pretty well. Okay, so you had this life that was pretty much consumed by music <laughs> and then you retired. Ah, yes. What was that like? Mm. Well, my wife Marilyn and I retired at the same year from Cincinnati. She was a CFO with a major nonprofit. We moved to Stanford, um, just down the road, and lived at a community, golfing community called Carolina Trace. Didn't know a soul, but we were blessed to have great neighbors. Yes, you were. And <laughs> who, uh, you know, of course, the, the people make any group, mm -hmm. any, any place that you live. And that's so true here. But it was especially true there as well. And over the 10 years that we lived there, you know, you just get involved. Um, and both at the community level and within the, uh, the smaller communities. Um, and that was really great. Uh, so no regrets leaving music behind somewhat? Oh. Yeah, it was a, an adjustment, that's for sure. And as Kay knows, I had one attempt at trying to start a little band at, at, <laughs> <laughs> at Carolina Trace, and that I think we had a violin who hadn't played since junior high, uh, and we had a saxophone. Guitar. We had a guitar. <laughs> I don't know, throw in a flutophone or something. I mean, it was the most hodgepodge group of people. And Kay was the most accomplished musician in the group. And I would love to be out. I'd be walking my dog and I would hear Kay. They lived just two, two doors down. And she would be practicing. <laughs> so you'd hear strains of saxophone over our neighborhood. It was wonderful. But I did miss it. Uh, and now that I'm here, the opportunity to make music with my lady friends has really given me new life. I'm, I'm, uh, I enjoy the challenge of working with this age group. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's different. Uh, I enjoy the challenge of writing for the group and picking music that's appropriate. That's really turned out to be wonderful. And uh, that's given me like, like a new breath. Uh, so I, I just love my, my little group. And we're going to have a new addition. We have a three octave set of handbells that uh, Tom and Becky Talbot have donated to us. So I now I know, wow. I know. So if you're watching out there in October, and you're interested in trying to learn how to play one of these instruments, <laughs> give me a call. 
an email and we'll see what we can work out. And I also saw recently um, that you now have very comfortable seats. Well, we to do. Sit on we do. <laughs> I know. As the, as our population <laughs> ages, I've been, I was told that. Well, we don't want to always stand. Yeah. So this is really great. Resident Council, I owe them a big shout out for for doing that. Right. That was very nice. We've been very lucky, uh, and there's a lot of nice things that are happening for us right now. Ron, what else aside from music has? Um, River Landing meant to you? Well, it's given me the opportunity to, uh, well, to meet a whole new group of people, obviously. And that's great. I feel like we have two families now. We have our new River Landing friends, and we have our friends from Carolina Trace. And so that's, that's really been a plus for us. That was me. Um, but I'm lucky that I'm playing golf. I'm playing tennis. My tennis is the best it's ever been, he said very modestly. <laughs> uh, pickleball, I enjoy pickleball. Uh, and right now, you know, this is, I'm 75, and this is the time when people's bodies tend to have issues. And so far, knock on wood, I've been lucky. I'm wow, touch wood. Amen. Amen. I have all my original parts, so that's, <laughs> that's good. So it's been, that's really been great. Yeah. Any surprises in general at River Landing for you? No, I think this place is what you make of it. If you want to get involved, get involved. There's, there's lots of things to do. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, whether it's committee work or arts and crafts, playing in the chimes, being in the choir, whatever it might be, there's always things like that that you can do. So I, I kind of feel badly for the, those people who don't, you know, maybe they don't read, maybe their bodies are, you know, they have more issues. Yeah. But this place is, that's why we're here. It's because we know we're all going to have issues at some point. And the transition this transitional living that they talk about is important. Um, so let's get to the question. Mm. <laughs> um, I have to get my notes out here. For this. In all of time. In all of time. Um, who are three or four people that you, if the details were sorted out, mm -hmm. would like to spend a bit of time with and yeah. why? It's really a kind of a good question. Um, it's kind of like the old interview question, where do you see yourself mm -hmm. in five years? Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of a loaded, loaded answer. Um, but, so I think Gandhi. I, I have really always respected this man and, and I'm not, not overtly religious but he approached life in such a gentle way and had such an influence. And boy, I think that I look back on what he was able to accomplish and what he still stands for uh, and thinking, you know, that, that would have been fascinating to see how that all evolved. Uh, mm -hmm. So he'd be maybe my religious figure, if you mm -hmm. will, quasi-religious. Uh, music, Mozart outside of the, I would like to have Mozart be here, because <laughs> I think living in 1700s was fraught with problems. Nobody lived very long in the diseases and so forth. Mm -hmm. But then again, I mean, that's part of what made him great was he was able to write all this wonderful, wonderful music in the midst of you know, poverty and despair and a lot of other things that were going on. I mean, his music is, so besides his music, was there anything about his life that makes you curious to know him more? Well, I, I think music was his life. Okay. I mean, I think that would have been fine for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you remember seeing Amadeus and this whole thing mm -hmm. with Salieri, that was all kind of for the, for the TV. There was supposedly there was some competition, but uh, the court, you know, 
being back there in the time of that, the finery of, of what people, how people dressed and, and acted, mm -hmm. things seem so much more civil than, <laughs> unlike, unlike right now. Uh, we seem to have forgotten the civility of our lives sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then the last one, um, I would love to know my mom before she got in it. When dad died, I uh, was going through these, you know, everybody has these little slides. And I was going through them and they showed, there was pictures of my mom and my dad. And, you know, I was think I was two or three. You know, and she was, she was a really lovely lady. And as she got older, she even got even more beautiful. And smart, she was so smart. But life just kind of, Dealt her a mm -hmm. tough, tough blow. So I would, I would love to be with her before she got all that, and do stuff with her. You know, just I'd love to dance with my mother. Mm -hmm. So that's that's great. Me. Thank you. Thank you, Ron, for being yeah. with us. <laughs> It's a great honor to be here. I don't know if I said that. I feel very privileged. Good. Well, we and appreciate your time, and I'm sure the viewers have enjoyed the information they've learned about you and your career. Thank you. I appreciate Thanks. it. And we look forward to. Oh, there's lots to look forward to. Musical events. There are lots to look forward to. Uh, the next month or two, yeah. and, and yeah. far beyond that. Yeah, absolutely. So. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Next week, we will be delighted to have another River Landing conversation. At the same time, same station, and um, good afternoon, have a nice weekend. <laughs>